Hello, everyone. My name is Rio. I'm here to work with you on the Hamilton Education SAT Test 301. This is a test that we here at Hamilton Education have put together for you. Um, again, my name is Rio. I help run the humanities department here at Hamilton Education. Some of you may know me from a class that you have with me or from tutoring or what have you. Uh, today, we'll be going through both modules of, or in this video, we'll be going through both modules of the reading and writing, 27 questions for module one, and this starts us out with module one. The first question we'll be looking at is question one. The first six questions of this module are all vocabulary, word and context questions. They some are very approachable, some are a little bit more difficult. This first question is one of the more difficult ones because there are a few words that we might not know, but let's do a couple of things, okay? First, we want to think, what word would we put in that underlined position? So, I mean, what word could we come up with on our own without looking at our answer choices to fit the context and the meaning of what this passage is saying? So, the Hope Diamond, is displayed at the Smithsonian Museum, carries a history shrouded in mystery. Originally part of the French crown jewels under Louis XIV, its journey to the Smithsonian involved numerous changes in ownership, each adding layers to its enigmatic past. Historical sources suggest the diamond's origins predate its Royal French connection by decades, further complicating efforts to something its true history. So. I would be looking for something along the lines of like uncover or make sense of uh, to understand, right? We're trying to understand what is its true history. Um, we, we don't know actually where it comes from, when it first shows up, etc. So once we have what we would want to be putting in that place, um, which we determined through context, we want to make sure that we go through and see, do any of these other answer choices align or with that as a, some sort of synonym with that word that we want to put there or not? Infiltrate. Infiltrate means to kind of sneak in behind uh, something, okay? So you're kind of being a spy. You send a spy to infiltrate enemy communications. Um, Infiltrate doesn't work here. Um, to sneak into its true history doesn't make any sense sort of grammatically, or, but it also doesn't fit the context. Denounce. So denounce is to essentially state a disagreement with someone else, okay? But in a very extreme way. Uh, it famously comes up a lot of times in political situations. Uh, you know, maybe a politician had invited somebody to speak at one of their conferences who turns out to be a fascist neo-Nazi or something like that. There will be requests for the politician that had this person at their conference to denounce those ideas, denounce the ideas of fascism or neo-Nazis or people making those claims. Um, and sometimes a politician will denounce and say, I do not believe these things, or they might say something else along the lines of, there, there are some good people in that. So denounce means to distance oneself from claim that something is bad. So to denounce its true history doesn't make sense either. Now, befuddle is an interesting one here that doesn't work. Uh, befuddle means to complicate or, or make unclear. Um, you can be befuddled by a perhaps this question, right? Confused, unsure, uh, you know, kind of, yeah, not, not knowing what's going on. Um, so does that bit of information befuddle its true history? Yes. But does it complicate efforts to befuddle its true history? Is there a goal in here to make its true history unclear? No. So, even if we don't know what ascertain means, and we are able to get rid of A, B, and C, we can be confident choosing ascertain. 
Now, what does ascertain mean? It means to acquire or understand, okay? Um, that's exactly what we're looking for. So if you know what ascertain means, this question was probably really easy. But if you don't know what ascertain means, which is probably why you're watching this video, this question becomes more difficult. In that case, we need to rely on strategy. We need to be getting rid of answer choices that don't align with the word we're looking for, something along the lines of understand or make sense, and arrive to something that maybe we don't know what it means, but we know that all the other ones do not. Okay, so question two here, a vocab question. If you missed this question, I presume you don't know what the answer means. Iconoclastic. Iconoclastic was a word you didn't know and you weren't able to get to it. But even if iconoclastic isn't a word that you know, with our idea of the 90-10 rule, being able to come up with the meanings of words by breaking them down, we should be able to arrive to iconoclastic as a correct answer, even if we don't even exactly from the beginning know what B, C, and D mean. So first, a series of paintings by multiple underground street artists is on display at the British Museum. Okay, stuffy British Museum. This blank collection uses graffiti and discarded plasticware to subvert the established canon. Okay, so we're subverting the established canon, the canon being kind of like typical art. And in doing that, we're doing something weird, something out of the ordinary, okay? So what I would be looking for is something like atypical or groundbreaking, unique. That's the sort of word I would be wanting to place in that underlined portion. Let's see if any word lines up with that. So as I mentioned, Iconoclastic is a word we may not know if we're missing this question. I want to look at the other ones first, words which we all should know or be able to figure out. Although we could also probably figure out iconoclastic with some deep understanding of Greek. But probably if you're missing this question, don't have that. So exclusionary, right? Exclusionary. If something is exclusionary, it is excluding typically in a kind of hierarchical way, okay? So there's a bit of a connotation in exclusionary. You're being exclusionary when you're limiting people who have, or anything, limiting things in a certain place. Um, and it has a connotation of kind of elitism in being exclusionary. How do we know this? Well, exclusion is a word we all should know. Airy is to kind of verbify it. It turns it into a verb. Um, sort of. So to be excluding, being exclusionary, work. it doesn't work here because how how is this limiting what else can be in the British Museum? Derivative we can get rid of. Derivative is maybe a word you haven't heard of in the art context because you probably don't really engage with art. Um, but all you smarty pantses at these schools who are teaching calculus when you're like 10 years old, for some reason, um, you know what a derivative is. So what is a derivative? A derivative is when we're finding an answer, finding information from a previous answer, right? You can derive something by having previously existing information, putting it through the works and arriving, making sense of a new thing. Derivative in the art context or in the humanities context means basically exactly the same thing, except it has a bit of a negative connotation. It means you are very demonstrative, you're demonstrating your influences. Someone else did this first and now you're doing something very similar, right? You hear it all the time in music. Oh, Olivia Rodrigo is derivative of Paramore or Taylor Swift or something, right? Or, you know, um, that, that's that's probably a, a relatively common example. I mean, all music right now is incredibly derivative, right? Meaning it sounds like something which existed before. Um, so to have a derivative collection would be something that is based off of what existed before. Is graffiti and discarded plasticware part of what exists before? Well, we know it isn't because it's not a part of the established canon. Now, parliamentary, finally, 
If you don't know what parliamentary means, think about the fact that parliament is a form of government, all right? Hopefully you know that, and if not, ooh. Um, parliament is like a type of government that's pretty similar to the United States. It's an elected body. Um, now, we are not in a parliamentary system, but whatever. Okay, so a parliamentary collection would be a collection that is either looking like parliament or produced by parliament. Is that at all conveyed here? No, okay. We should be able to get these three words, even if we don't know what iconoclastic is. So what does iconoclastic mean? Well, icon comes from Greek, icon. If you've ever engaged with art, which again, might be probably haven't, unfortunately, um, Greek icons and in the Orthodox Christian painting tradition, you have icons like the Mother Mary. Um, and then clastic comes from, um, I think, clastes or something like that. But it basically means to break in Greek. So breaking the typical image, breaking the icon is what iconoclastic means. It means going against the grain, doing something that hasn't been done before. So an iconoclastic collection, subverting the established canon, right? That is perfect. But do we need to know iconoclastic to get iconoclastic? No, we just need to know very, very elementary school words of exclusionary, derivative, and parliamentary in order to get to iconoclastic. The third question here on module one of test 301 is another vocab question. This is, in my opinion, a relatively straightforward vocab question where we just need to notice that we have a phrase, okay? We do not have only one word here. We are looking for a word that matches within a larger phrase. So the trade journal, blah, 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 published an article stating that the color pink was best suited for boys while girls should be adorned in blue. Okay, so this comes in 1918. Records such as this may blank credence to the assertion that historically the color was assigned to boys. Okay, so the color pink was assigned to boys historically. Um, so, uh, first things first, we need to notice that there's credence here. So we need to know what credence means. What does credence mean? Well, it comes from creed. Okay. Um, credence, creed meaning uh, belief or religion, um, you know, the band Creed, I will take you higher, you know, one of the greatest songs of all time um, was a Christian band, meaning believe. Uh, there's many times in American history where things will be invoked, like no matter your creed, meaning belief, right? So, Something credence. So we're looking to something along the line that says this may give credence to the assertion that historically the color was assigned to boys. So the first really good distractor to get rid of is implicate. So implicate would really work well um, in this sort of sentence if the sentence was written differently, right? Records such as this may implicate that the color was assigned to boys initially, right? That something like that would probably work. However, implicate credence doesn't work. Okay, so we need to be really paying attention to the fact that this is a whole phrase. Similarly, <clears throat> deny credence would mean to take away belief. If we're doing that, we're looking at the opposite of what we're looking for, so we can get rid of A. L when we were starting here, we were saying something along the lines of, we're looking for something that means to give credence. Um, so, to lend. All you people probably love business and money and the idea of lending, right? You all want to make money and be getting a career that's going to keep you in the class that you're in, right? You got to lend to do that. Um Lend credence is to give credence, to give believability to the assertion that historically pink was assigned for boys. So lend works. 
What does belay mean? Belay means to kind of like s- s- disguise, subvert, right? So you could say something along the lines of um, his smile and jolly manner belied his internal suffering, right? Doesn't work. Therefore, we have B. Question four here on module one. A lot of students miss. And it shows to me that students don't read the whole question or the whole passage. Because every word that is relevant to this passage, every answer choice for this passage that is relevant is really easy to understand. Oftentimes, students have a hard time getting a correct answer choice if the correct answer choice is a word that's difficult difficult to know. However, focus on is our correct answer choice. Every single person knows what focus on means. But it is easy to overlook what focus on means in this if we're only reading our first sentence. So according to market researchers, economic recessions cause shoppers to blank an item's price point. If you follow the strategy, which is the wrong strategy, of taking every answer choice and just popping it in and seeing what you sounds good and what do you like, economic recessions cause shoppers to overlook an item's price point sounds perfectly fine. But we aren't dealing with just that sentence. We are dealing with a passage as a whole. If you do not read the rest of this passage, overlook sounds fine. But then you see that a discount of 10% will register with the consumer more powerfully than brand name recognition, nutritional value, or even celebrity endorsement of the item. Meaning discounts are the most important thing to consumers or shoppers during a recession. Why would overlook work? Saying that they ignore, uh, you know, the price of an item during a recession doesn't make any sense when they say in the next sentence that a discount is the biggest thing they will look at. So focus on works here if you just read the whole thing. But it doesn't sound super academic or smart uh, in a kind of pseudo way uh, in that first sentence alone. So you might think, ah, I need to choose something else. So the SAT is too sophisticated. They would never choose something that I understand. No, that's not the case at all. Their language conveys meaning. And A, focus on conveys the meaning of this passage. If you're missing this question, you just didn't read the whole thing. Obfuscate means to sort of disguise, okay? Um, when, uh, When you're walking down the aisle to get married, you wear a veil to obfus- obfuscate your face and your emotions, right? It distorts it slightly. And then grapple with is like to sort of wrestle with something um, to make sense of something that is a little bit difficult. But you don't even need to know those things. All you need to know is that focus on works and every single one of you knows what that language means. So if you just didn't read the whole passage, you're going to get this wrong and you're going to get a lot wrong if you're not doing that. So make sure you read the whole context. Question five here of module one is a vocab question in which there are a few words, a few vocab words here, which are maybe hard to know. If you're missing this because you don't know all the words that we have present here, that makes sense. All right, that happens. Um, but we still can likely get closer to a correct answer through strategy. So across multiple species, a number of individual animals develop polydactyle, a seemingly random condition. Okay, this is important. Seemingly random condition causing extra fingers or toes. For many with polydactyl, there seems to be no clear cause. Okay, again, this is important. However, it may occur as a medical syndrome or be an inherited trait sometimes. Thus, researchers clarify that polydactyl cannot be solely blank, okay? So it cannot be solely blank. It sometimes, these extra digits may follow fixed genetic or medical tools. Okay, so this word fixed is really important here. 
So sometimes it is fixed. So we're looking for the opposite of fixed, okay? We're looking for the opposite there. So what is the opposite of fixed, okay? So predetermined describes this. Sometimes extra digits is predetermined is basically what the second part says. So we're looking for the opposite of predetermined. If we're choosing predetermined, we might be moving too quickly or not noticing things like cannot be char characterized solely as. That cannot is really important. So if we're choosing predetermined, we're probably just moving a little too quickly here. A misnomer means misnamed. Okay, so nominal, in name only. Gnome means name. Miss, as we know, means not, right? So a mistake is when you're doing the wrong thing. Okay, you're doing the wrong take. So misnomer means the wrong name. Um, comprehensible cannot be solely characterized as comprehensible. We should know what comprehensible means. To comprehend something means to understand it. If something is comprehensible, it means it's understandable. Um, for example, if you do not speak French, French will not be comprehensible for you. But if you do speak English, English is comprehensible. But sometimes certain places have an accent that makes that English incomprehensible. I was born in West Virginia. Some people in West Virginia, they're incomprehensible. Uh, but nonetheless, we should be able to get aberration here if we're able to know and utilize our 90-10 rule of figuring out words by looking at roots, looking at, you know, what com what constituent elements make up the word, and getting to see. We should probably be able to figure out what misnomer means, predetermined, comprehensible. But it's relatively difficult. So what is aberration? An aberration is basically something that is out of the normal, a deviation. So it's perfect, right? So it cannot be solely characterized as a deviation because that is the opposite of predetermined or fixed, right? An aberration is something that is not fixed. It's a kind of an exception, but it's not only an exception. Sometimes it does follow genetic or medical cues. So question six here on module one is definitely the most difficult vocab question we've had. Um, if you miss this one, you probably just don't have a super wide range of vocabulary and you're going to want to keep studying vocab. However, there is a, a pathway to getting what's correct here. So we want to find a synonym for the word we want here. We want to find our own word for this. Melancholy, maybe desolate right? We're looking for a sad. The effect is sad, okay? Something along the lines of sad. So let's look at our answer choices and see if there are any opposites of sad. Ecstatic is the opposite of sad. Ecstatic means ecstasy. You're really happy. D is saccharin. Saccharin means sweet. All you chemistry type people out here might understand saccharin because you've heard it in chemistry. Saccharin means sweet. Erroneous means wrong, okay? Wrong doesn't mean sad. So the only answer choice that would ever possibly work is plaintive. Now, what does plaintive mean? A plaintive melody is kind of meaning a sad one, okay? Usually it's used in the context of something mournful, usually kind of relating around death, right? A lot of times in movies, the score will be plaintive when they need to contemplate the loss of someone, you know, some superhero and some silly superhero movie dies and then a plaintive melody comes through and it's a cue for, you know, all the like feeble minded of the world to like cry. Um, that's, that's, would be a plaintive melody. All right. So the effect is a sad one. It's a plaintive one. However, if you're missing this question, it's a toughie, okay? This is probably about the toughest question I could ever see in vocab on the actual SAT. But nonetheless, it is a it is a clue of what you need to do, which is studying vocabulary that we make accessible for you. With that, we are done with the vocab. 
So for question seven, if you're missing this question, you are likely missing qualifiers. All right, so we've all already read this passage before. It's about a guy building a particular proof <clears throat> that proves a theorem that was conjectured a long time ago, but never made sense of by mathematicians. So we know that the correct answer is A. I want to demonstrate what's wrong in these other answer choices. So for one, we want to be focused on the main idea. Okay. In answer choice B, we have something of a two extreme or like exclusionary distractor. Okay. When we see a word, a qualifier like solely or only, anything that's absolute, the most, the least, anything like that, we don't want to get rid of that answer choice automatically, but we want to be suspicious of it. So, for example, um, we this is all correct, this first part, right? We get two papers spanning 129 pages, but one is the main idea that it's focusing solely on this without any reference to prior mathematical works? No. Okay, so that part is what is wrong in B. C, what's wrong with this answer choice? So, um, yes, this might be true, but is this something that's discussed explicitly in the passage? No, we could infer maybe that he gathered that from, we can maybe infer that from what the significance of proving the theorem. Um, and additionally, this isn't the main idea, right? So. Again, B is disproven by this. C is disproven by the thing as a whole. Um, and then finally, D, what makes D wrong? Right here. Okay. So the algebraic geometry and number theory stuff was used not in the 1993 work, but after a year of further work. So this references only his first proof, which was found to have an error, not the second proof, which was supported. So that is what's wrong with all the other ones. If you're missing a question like this, you're not hunting for what's wrong in an answer choice. You're hunting for what's right. All of these have something right. This is good here, right? This is good here, right? This is good here. But as a whole, only this one has nothing wrong with it. So we're missing answer choice eight, which is asking us to discern the main purpose of a text. It's likely that we're having a hard time noticing distractors or what makes things distractors via qualifiers and other answer choices. We're likely not looking for what is wrong. Our goal should always be to find what makes an answer choice wrong rather than to find what makes an answer choice right. So, for example, with A, palaces, fire, and water are less important than freedom. Um, is this a universal? No, it's only in this context, okay? So, this is wrong because that is not the main purpose of the text. The main purpose of the text is to talk about them staying in Petrograd. B, to express regret that they stayed behind to preserve the city. It's actually the opposite, right? They, they don't express any regret. They're, they're saying that they did it because they had to. And then D, so many strangers wish to help them. It's an opposite distractor. No one wants to help them. So what is it? They're staying and nobody likes that they're staying, right? So no one wants to help us because we stayed. So that's the unpopular decision. And now why? Because we love our city and wanted to preserve it more than running away. So always look for what's wrong in an answer choice before you seek what's right. That will get us closer to a correct answer. Question nine, we have a detailed question. According to the text gives a way that we want to find alignments in the text. So the answer, correct answer of C, it says, willingly chose to study in Tokyo, but anticipates coming home. We can see both of these, right? I came to Tokyo of my own free will. That means willingly. But he dreams often of home, right? 
because he knows you'll return when holidays come. So that is uh, that. Uh, now let's find what's wrong with these other ones. Preferred city life over his hometown. Um, no, that's the opposite, right? He seems to always be yearning for home. Now, profound sense of displacement and discomfort in Tokyo. We could infer that in an English class, perhaps. But in the SAT, we do not want to go too far with our inferences. B goes a little bit too far. Profound sense of displacement and discomfort is not attested to in the text. We can infer maybe, you know, he likes the other place more. But we also see the great city. That seems to suggest he doesn't have a profound sense of displacement and discomfort. And then D is a total opposite distractor because of everything that makes B correct or C correct. So therefore, our only answer that makes any sense is C. Question 10 here on module one. We have the main idea of the text. The main idea is that <clears throat> we have multiple different things going into a modern design. All right, so um, let's get rid of distractors. How do we know this? How could we know this in the text? If you're choosing B, you're not noticing that this is not attested to in the text, nor is it the main idea. Um, A, we're talking about all of the different influences that are present for Diola Sergoe. And these are part of what are her influences. Um, so the fact that she would reject the use of this doesn't make any sense because it says she uses it. So A, there's an opposite distractor saying she rejects using the thing that she actually uses. And B is not attested to in the text. And then C, does at any point it mention she doesn't use aso okay and kamole? No, it says that she uses aso ole and kamole. So as a result, all three of these, there's something absolutely wrong in them. Whereas D, there's nothing wrong. This, I don't even need to explain D, right? What we are focusing on is, is there something clearly wrong in an answer choice? And if there is, we get rid of it, right? With D, does she do this? Yes, right? She uses folklore. She blends it with lace, uses the traditional Yoruba cloth in her collection, Kamole. All true. There we go. For question 11 here on module one, what my goal is, is to show you what is wrong in our other answer choices. If you're missing a question like 11, you are not being rigorous enough in getting rid of incorrect answer choices rather than seeking correct answer choices. So does this underlying sentence, identify wolves as the reason for a painful injury and blurred vision? No. Um, so, Is it possible that he had these pains and these things? Sure. But it isn't that, that is not the reason why he is having this pain. Okay. Um, it doesn't identify that at any point. C, it flashes back to the past to explain what P2's father calls him to explain that he's called names when he was a child. Um, do we see his father? We see people of his village. Father is too specific. It's a distractor, too specific distractor. 90% of C could be correct, but that word father is incorrect. Finally, do we see P2 transform into a leader of the black wolves? Right here? No, not whatsoever. So there's no compelling reason for B, C, or D. So therefore, A is the only one which has anything going for it. Now, 
we do have a changing relationship with his name. At one point, it embarrassed him. But now it was what gave him strength while he's being fought with wolves. Therefore, A. For question 12 here of module one, <clears throat> we have a command of evidence question based off of quantitative information, right? So we're putting this graph and this text together. One thing I wanna remind you of is, sometimes you'll have answer choices that would work for supporting a claim. So for example, this question asks, which choice best describes data from the graph that would support the researcher's conclusion? And what was their conclusion that Turkey experienced significant population growth? Um, so um, you might see an answer choice which is true, or well, which would support this conclusion, which would show population growth, growth in Turkey, but it isn't actually true in the graph, all right? So this is Turkey, it's going up. That looks like population growth to me. Germany doesn't go really up, but we're just focused on this. So A is wrong. Germany is true, but Turkey, no. It, um, the population, so is B, this is true, seemingly. Actually, maybe not. The graph is sort of hard to read. Looks like it actually might be a little bit higher in 2022. But again, it also doesn't, it's irrelevant, right? Is Germany at all consideration from this? No. C. This isn't even true, right? Also, if it were true, were it relevant? No. The only one is D. So sometimes these are simpler than you might expect. If it's a simple question, find a simple answer, right? Be prepared to... The, the test isn't so sophisticated that getting a simple answer, you should be afraid of it, by no means. Okay, so question 13 is probably the most difficult reading question we have in module one. I want to focus on this here. Hypothesis stated at the end of the passage, okay? So there's more than one hypothesis presented, all right? Um, <clears throat> the first is sort of the idea that um, because they trample things, you would expect it to be uh, small plants would be gone. But however, you see the opposite. You see a higher thriving of smaller plants in areas with fewer elephants. Okay, so let's find the actual ending hypothesis, though. Researchers theorized... Researchers theorized that the periodic disturbance caused by elephants promotes aeration and nutrient cycling meaning a more conducive environment for a diverse array of plants. So what would undermine that thesis? What would undermine it is that elephants do not produce nutrient cycling and do not produce a more diverse array of plants, especially the smaller ones, right? So the hypothesis, more elephants equals more diversity equals more small animals because of nutrient cycling and aeration. So we want to find the opposite of that, okay? So A would support this hypothesis. So if you are not noticing undermine deeply enough, you might select A thinking you're answering a different question. And A would be correct if it said support the hypothesis, but it doesn't, it says undermine. So it's like being asked, you know, what color is the sky? Oh, it's going to be a nice day today. Right? That's not answering what color the sky is. Sort of inferring it, but it's not right. B, soil samples with frequent show, with frequent elephant activity show all of these things. This is again an opposite distractor. This supports the hypothesis, doesn't undermine it. Okay. Why? Well, if you have a greater plant diversity in areas with higher nutrient cycling and more elephants, 
That's exactly what they're suggesting would happen. So that is a opposite distractor. Supports the hypothesis, but we're looking to undermine it. C. Ah, this is good. It says smaller plant species decline, especially in diversity, as elephant populations stick around and get bigger. That would suggest, oh, elephants are not always good for diversity or soil health. Finally, D, at some sites in the study, the health of plants unrelated correlates negatively with the presence and longevity of animal elephant populations. Um, this doesn't make any sense because these are plants that are not impacted by nutrient cycling or soil disturbance. All right. So this is outside of the realm of study, outside of what's being considered. Okay. Um, if an animal eats grass, you know, th th this is just going outside of the study. So the only one that has nothing wrong with it is C, and C perfectly undermines the hypothesis that more elephants equals greater diversity, more so, so in small plants. For questions like 14, which is a logical completion question, an inference question, we want to look for language that demonstrates what we're looking for. This word thus, this transitional adverb is a really important word, it means we are exemplifying or proving what comes beforehand. So our historians have mainly seen Lee Krasner as Jackson Pollock's husband, but, you know, that means she's overshadowed, but Krasner was a skilled artist in her own right, including some groundbreaking pieces. Thus, those who primarily see Krasner as a muse for Pollock's heart are basically missing out on how important Krasner is as an artist herself. Okay, so we want an answer choice which completes that. It completes the logical claim. How do we know it? How is it objective? Because of this word thus. Thus clarifies what must come next. <clears throat> so B is wrong or A is wrong because it focuses on Jackson Pollock and other influences. Now, Jackson Pollock is basically not important in this passage. We're focusing on Lee Krasner. B, risk undermining or risk diminishing the importance of Krasner's own con contributions to abstract expressionism. That's perfect, right? That's exactly the kind of thing that would be supported. C, believe that artwork from Krasner must have been, would have been much diminished without Pollock's influence. While that might be something that an art historian could possibly believe, this doesn't make sense with that thus. Again, the thus is super important. This disproves that thus, which is why we can get rid of C. And D, while that might be cool, while that might be true, this is a true but irrelevant distractor. Is this actually forwarding or, or putting forth any sort of evidence or sort of explanation of the claim that Krasner was a solid abstract expressionist in her own right? No, that's just an explanation of a painting that maybe could exemplify that, but it's not, it's not, it's true, but it might, it, it might be true, but it is irrelevant in this case. Therefore, we go with B. For 15, we have a bunch of different factors relevant here, okay? We want to keep them all clear. What is M. Capitata? What is Portes Compressa? Okay, these are two different types of coral. One, it evolved some resistance to bleaching, but others were stressed. Okay, so we know that this is about bleaching and uh, stress on corals, right? Whereas the other one, Capitata, struggled with even resistant colonies failing to show enhanced survival. They didn't correlate with improved survival or recovery. Okay, so Compressa, relatively hardy. They showed signs of recovery and physiological adaptation. Capitata struggles and doesn't adapt. All right, so answer choices. A, what's wrong here? We're talking about the wrong one. So even though Compressa shows a good ability to survive in the face of heat waves compared to Capitata, we're not, this is the wrong one. 
we would have to be talking about Compressa there. C, um, do we have long-term survival? What one word do I really dislike in C? All coral, right? Now, maybe some coral will benefit or will be able to adapt and acclimatize, but all coral will not because why? Capitata doesn't, okay? We see that already. And then finally, genetic factors, regardless of escalating marine heat waves and coral resilience, do we see genetic factors here? We hear about complexity, right? Do we see anything about genetics throughout? No. This is one of those, maybe you could infer, maybe you could guess, it's likely possible, but it isn't clarified in the text. And all we care about is in the text. So is B the most interesting answer choice we're given here? Challenge conventional views on coral resilience and emphasize the complex nature. That has our stuff there, complex nature, complex nature. Survival beyond bleaching, right? Survival beyond bleaching. Um, that's everything we're looking for. Therefore, B. 16 is our final reading question for module one of this Hamilton 301 test. The Epic of Gilgamesh, that's what it talks about. So we're really learning about the various stages in the various languages. So first, we have Sumerian language in this era. Later, Bab Babylonians wrote it in Akkadian. All right, so we are getting Sumerian and then Akkadian. Sumerian from the Sumerians, Akkadian from Babylonians. You know, some 500 years later. So the king, the Epic of Gilgamesh is uh, various stages. All right, so a single composition in the Akkadian language. We know that that's not true because it says so right there. That's where it's wrong. That disproves A. Um, without any external influences, how is that relevant, right? Um, how is that relevant? Um, finally, D, they were first documented during Ashurbanipal. No. Right? That's the 7th century BCE. We see that it was initially written in 2200 BCE. So the only one that has nothing wrong with it is B, which is that it was initially written in Sumerian. We already have that underlined in blue and later synthesized by Babylonian scribes in Akkadian. Also true, right? There we go. Question 17 here on module one is a tense question, making sure that we are in the proper tense. We're really looking at these auxiliary verbs or helping verbs as they're sometimes called to make sense of what tense we need to be in. So we see that we are starting in a different era. Okay, so we're starting in 1945. UN had 51 member states. But then by 2015, which is a more recent past than 1945, but still the past, the organization grew to include 193 member states, okay? So let's look at the differences between our tenses here. Um, <clears throat> grows to would put us into a uh, kind of present or future type tense. Uh, doesn't really work here. D is again, future tense. Um, Sim that's the simple future. Um, neither of those work because we're, we're operating in a near past. So grown is definitely good. So we like A or B because of that grown. So now we're deciding between has grown, which would put us in our present perfect. That means that it's began in the past, but it's still going on. Or it would put us in our past perfect, right? Um, which would mean it is in the past and it's that it puts us in our past. Okay. So because we have 2015, 10 years ago now, had grown is what we would want. 
I have a feeling that on the official SAT, we might see something more like 2005. Because uh, 2015 feels perhaps just ever so recent that you might want to think, ah, is this present day? Does 2015 count as present day or, or not? As time goes on, I, I'm recording this in 2024. As time goes on, that 2015 will feel ever more like had grown. So that's why we went with had grown and thought that was good. So remember, had grown puts us in our past perfect, which is perfect here. Question 18 is asking about how we put together independent clauses. How do we separate them or connect them into one sentence or into multiple sentences? It's basically asking, can you, can you identify whether these can stand on their own or whether they can't? And what do we do with that? Okay, so this characteristic makes NaCl, sodium chloride, an effective agent for de-icing roads. Sodium chloride can be applied to icy surfaces, whereupon it interacts with the thin layer of water atop the ice, reducing, reducing its freezing point. So, this, are, this is an example of two independent clauses. What are our three options for separating two independent clauses? We can use a comma with a fanboys conjunction. We can use just a semicolon. Or we can use just a period. And A is perfectly that, all right? B is a run-on. C is a comma splice. And D is a run-on with a conjunction, okay? If D had a comma, we'd be good. If C had a fanboys, it'd be fine, all right? But seeing as that none of them do, we have a mistake. The one that I feel like if you're missing this question, then you're likely selecting is C. Because it does seem like it's explaining the previous clause. However, if they can both stand alone, we cannot just put a comma between them. That's insufficient. A period or a semicolon would likely be most appropriate. And here we have a period given to us as an option. Therefore, we go with A. Question 19 gives us a question about both whether we are in a possessive or non-possessive, regenerative or normal state and whether we have a plural or non-plural object, all right? So I want to show why I think B... So first things first, let's, let's just do first things first, sorry. We very clearly need fabric or fabrics to be possessive, all right? So the one option which is not possessive is D, we need to get rid of that. Additionally, sides will cling the sides are not possessing the will to cling, right? It's just what they will do. So sides doesn't need to be possessive. Remember, this apostrophe here is only operating to show possession. It doesn't have anything to do with whether a thing is plural or not. So we are between, is fabrics plural and possessive or is fabrics singular and possessive? B is plural and possessive, C is singular and possessive. The first thing we can see, this this is singular all right that really should show us that alone should point us to c but one other thing okay i understand why b might be difficult we kind of are given two part fastening system we get one side with tiny stiff hooks and another with loops this seems like ah oh, maybe i'm inferring this as two different fabrics okay that is why b is maybe compelling but remember this is singular if it was these fabrics, these innovative fabrics will cling when pressed together. Then we would maybe be with B, but it doesn't say these, it says this. That this shows that we are in the singular, therefore we're singular possessive with fabrics and just generally uh, plural with sides, that leaves us with C. Money is a difficult question if we're not reading the whole sentence, if we're not reading the whole passage. If we read it very simply and we just think what best fits there, what sounds best to my ear before you finished, it will be really easy um, to go with C or A. But there's a reason why both of those are wrong. I want to show that we have two independent clauses here. Up, down, and strange are three of the six types of quarks that make up matter. 
Together with charm bottom and top, these elementary particles combine in various ways to form protons, neutrons, and other subatomic particles. When we read the whole thing, we see we have two independent clauses here. One independent clause which begins with up and ends with matter, and one which begins with together and ends with particles. As a result, we need to separate these two independent clauses with what kind of punctuation we can use to separate independent clauses. We could have used a period, we could have used a semicolon, we could have used a common a fanboys. What option are we actually given? D. Now, it sounds like together with charm top and bottom, make up, you know, I can understand reading like this. Up, down, and strange are three of the six types of quorums that make up matter together with charm bottom and top. If top was a period, A or C you could either choose between, but top doesn't end with a period, ends with a comma. Therefore, none of these other ones work because they create errors of either comma splices or run-ons or uh, improperly embedded transitions. We're looking for the one that makes no mistakes. D makes no mistakes. Therefore, D. So 21 is a very difficult question here on module one because we have two different things which we're determining whether they're singular or plural first, and then whether they are possessive or non-possessive secondly, okay? So first we have the desert. Is the desert singular or plural? So let's check. The Atacama Desert, all right? The Atacama Desert. The desert, okay, up there, which needs a space, but whatever. Um, the desert means that we are a singular desert. All right. As such, we have to get rid of answer choices A and D. Why? Well, both A and D put deserts in the plural, regardless of whether it's possessive or not. So then our second level is, is deserts possessive or is it not possessive? Well, it clearly must be possessive seeing as that both B and C have desert in the possessive form. But let's show why it is. Multiple telescopes on the desert's dry surface. So it's the dry surface of the desert. So this could also be written, multiple telescopes on the dry surface of the desert gather. Okay, so that shows that we have it in possessive. So possessive works. So B, C, and D all have deserts as possessive, but D, deserts as plural. We know that desert must be singular. We're just talking about the Atacama Desert. So now we move to stars. Is stars possessive or not possessive? So we know that there's more than one star, okay? Let's decide between whether the stars are singular or possessive. So if we stopped at stars, if we do not read the rest of the sentence, which is likely what happened if you missed this question, it sounds like stars isn't possessive. Multiple telescopes on the desert's dry surface gather data on thousands of stars. That resolves right there. In that case, it's just more than one star. However, do not forget that this sentence includes hidden origins. We can always test if something is possessive or not by putting it in the of the form. So multiple telescopes on the dry surface of the desert gather data on thousands of hidden origins of stars, on the thousands of hidden origins of the stars. Okay. The hidden origins is something that the stars possess. Therefore, stars must be possessive. We know it's plural already, so it's possessive as well. If something is made, possess made plural with an S, we use an apostrophe after the S to show that it is possessive. So therefore, we are left with C. Question 21 is asking us about how we put this list together. Okay, or not exactly a list. What we really have is uh, a dependent and independent clause. So independent clause. Midnight's Children chronicles India's tumultuous history through the lives of its protagonists born at the stroke of midnight on the country's Independence Day. That could just be a sentence. Notice I skipped something. I skipped, for instance, 
right? The comma after Midnight's Children has nothing to do with Midnight's Children. It has to do with what I skipped, the non-essential phrase embedded transition of for instance. We don't need it there. Now, does it help? Yeah, it shows that we're exemplifying or giving an instance of Salman Rushdie's intricate tales. All right. But well, whether we are, how we are producing this sentence, which is a complex sentence with our subordinate conjunction, creating a dependent clause after a while, the four instances are relevant to that calculation. So do not consider this comma after Midnight's Children as starting a list. So Midnight's Children chronicles India's tumultuous history through the lives of its protagonists, born at the stroke of midnight on the country's Independence Day. While blank blends the historical, historical epochs of Renaissance Florence and Mughal India to craft a story of blah, blah, and blah. All right, we just have a simple dependent clause here, starting with while. We don't need any punctuation after the Enchantress of Florence, right? All of these other pieces of punctuation do something irrelevant. Why would we need a comma after the Enchantress of Florence? While the Enchantress of Florence, no need for any of this, okay? Therefore, we have C. What would throw this off? This section here, all right? Make sure we're reading units of information in writing, on the writing section, and making sense of what do they do and why are they there and what is their consequence on the rest of the context of the passage. For 23, I want us remembering that we want to be deductive in how we get to an answer. We want to get rid of things, okay? So we've all read this, but basically a singer rose to prominence in the 80s, renowned for a distinctive voice and evocation of Morna, a traditional Cape Verdean music genre. Evora offered listeners a window into the culture and history of the islands. Blank, her 2004 Grammy Award win was a triumphant recognition of her impact on fans around the world. All right, so, however, does not make sense, right? However, her win. That would suggest that this refutes this. But this builds, the second part builds on what comes before. It says, her win is a culmination of all this other stuff. Regardless means that it's irrelevant or unrelated, sort of, to what comes before. It's not unrelated. It builds on it. Alternatively, means it's an opposite, right? But it doesn't. It builds on what comes before. What shows building? Thus. So, I want us making sure we're putting the category of our transition word into this missing section to see, is it fulfilling the role that the passage must take? If it isn't, it's wrong. Question 24 is the first of our rhetorical synthesis questions on this test. I want us, unlike every other question type, looking at the question before we read the passage. So we want to introduce the novel to an audience unfamiliar with the author. So we want to introduce basically what the novel is and who the author is. So we only want those two parameters. If we don't have both of them, it's wrong. If we have other ones, it's wrong. Okay. So Orhan Pamuk is the author. Oops, I'm using the wrong color there. That is the yellow information. So Orhan Pamuk, native of Istanbul, Tur Turkey. Cool. All right. Now, the author. We have, now we need the book, Strangeness in the Mind, which chronicles a Boza seller. So we need to say Orhan Pamuk, a native of Istanbul, Turkey, wrote a Strangeness of the Mind, which talks about Istanbul. Okay. Something like that. So, A. We have plenty about Orhan Pamuk, but what is missing? Anything about the book. We don't learn about the book. We need to learn about the book. We introduce Orhan Pamuk here, and we introduce a strangeness. Oh, no. That actually not sufficient. We don't really introduce Orhan Pamuk enough here. 
my opinion. We just have the name. So while we have a strangeness in the mind, we are missing anything about who Orhan Pamuk is. We just have the name. Therefore, we get rid of B. With C, we have about a strangeness in the mind. And we have about Orhan Pamuk, the Nobel Prize winner. Therefore, that has both her pink and yellow, which means it's good. Finally, just to make sure, D, we get the pink, but we miss the yellow. Therefore, only C makes sense. Question 25 is one of our rhetorical synthesis questions, meaning we need to look only at the question first and then find which things do we need and which things do we not need. So we want to emphasize, really important word, the relative sizes, really important, of the two Mars. This is one of those ones where being a smart student kind of puts you at a disadvantage here, all right? Why? Okay, so we get the sizes of the two different Mars. And then, Question A gives us the size of the two different Mars. Okay, cool. That seems good. I'm going to look at that for now, okay? It just says that they are different sizes. B does the exact same thing, though. What's the difference between B and A? And then C does the exact same thing as A and B. What are we really being asked here? We're not being asked to list the relative size or the, to list the sizes. We want to emphasize the relative sizes. So does B or A compare? No. Therefore, we are not talking about the relative sizes because relative size requires comparison. Now, does any student with a semi-functioning brain, are they going to know that 68,000 is smaller than 340,000? Yes, they will. They will be able to discern the relative size of the two mirrors. But we need to emphasize that. That's what the student wants to do. Which one shows that here? Because this is the only one that actually compares them. Now, D is interesting, but it only talks about Maririum. Therefore, C is the only one which actually puts these two into comparison, meaning the only one where we actually are comparing or emphasizing the relative sizes the sizes in comparison to one another. For 26, we are being asked a rhetorical synthesis question, meaning we really need to look at the question first. We want to emphasize a key difference between, on the one hand, Art Nouveau, and on the other hand, Art Deco. All right, so we get Art Nouveau and Art Deco, the difference between them. So without even reading the text, we already read the text, of course, to answer this, but I know that A is wrong. Why do I know that A is wrong? This is a similarity. We're looking for a key difference. So even if they both use intricate patterns and geometric shapes, putting them into comparison doesn't work. All right. Now let's look at the other ones. Okay. Let's look at our passage first. All right. Um, so Art Nouveau of Alphonse Mucha is intricate patterns and curved lines featuring female figures, lush flora from nature. All right. Tamara de Limpica is Art Deco. And in Art Deco, we have bold geometric comp compositions reflecting glamour in the Roaring Twenties. All right. So, B, we have floral in female form, there's the green, and we have Art Deco, modernity, glamour. All right, the only thing I don't see geometry, but it's both green and yellow, so that's a pretty good look so far. Looking at C, we have something that, if true, would be a difference, but more dreamlike? When do we hear that? Realism? When do we hear that? These are things which are not explicitly discussed in the passage, therefore it's wrong. D, all right, 
we get Art Nouveau and Art Deco, we get them, but we're not comparing the actual styles. So the only one that actually compares the styles is B. I'd like maybe a little bit more information about these styles for B, but the other ones have something glaringly wrong with them, and that's why we arrive to B. So for our final question here on module one, rhetorical synthesis question, we want to be looking at our question first, unlike every other question. We're going to read the question before the passage. So we want to emphasize the decline in unique languages, and we want to specify the reasons for this decline. So we need both. So um, how do we emphasize the decline? Well, several have become extinct. Younger generations no longer speaking them. Many languages are endangered or becoming extinct in the near future. All right. So that's a big decline in unique languages. What are the reasons? Well, deforestation and external pressures in particular, and this is kind of the same thing, you know, younger generations no longer speaking. All right, so the youth need to speak more of the languages to overcome things like these other things. Uh, and the reason we know that this is happening is because they're disappearing. Um, so, A. I do not, so... This is just what they're doing to preserve it. Now, the notes make A seem like probably the best summary of what's important in the notes. But is that answering what the question asks? No, that's why A is wrong. B, we show the decline, but do we have reasoning for the decline? No. So again, we, we show the decline, but we do not show the reasoning for the decline. C, we show the decline, but we don't give the reasoning for the decline. D, we show the decline and we show a reason for the decline. So. A lack of intergenerational transmission, dwindling number of speakers, external pressures. D has yellow and pink. Everything else has only pink or not. All. That brings us to an end of module one. We're now into module two for test 301. Our first question, number one, being a vocab or word in context question. So I always am looking for some sort of synonym, definition, or antonym uh, that we can find in the somewhere else in the text to find a word that we would want to put in that missing category. So according to many film and literature critics, Harper Lee's To Kill a Mockingbird is a strong example of a novel successfully adapted for the screen. Many movie versions of novels stray from the plot. Okay, so. Stray from the plot or offer wildly differing versions of beloved characters. Okay. So I did that in yellow because that's the antonym. We're looking for something that is the opposite of that because directed by blah, blah, blah. The film effectively captures the essence of the novel offering a concise yet impactful retelling that keeps the narrative's core strengths. We're looking for something like keeps, um, something that doesn't stray away from the narrative's core strengths. So let's look at our first offering, softens. So softening the narrative's core strengths wouldn't be ideal if we're doing a good retelling in that it would stray from the narrative strengths. Avoiding the narrative strengths is also more synonymous with stray rather than an opposite of stray, which is what we're looking for. Retain, in the same way that a retaining wall 
keeps a hillside from eroding away. Uh, retain, keep means to keep. You could keep someone on retainer, meaning that they are like a lawyer, which will be consistently working with you, even if you don't have a particular lawsuit or something like that that's come up. Uh, retain means to keep. So that's exactly what we're looking for. Then quashing the narrative's core strengths is another opposite distractor because it doesn't mean to keep. So if you're missing this question, I really recommend you find, rather than plug in our answer choices and play them, I recommend you look for a word that you would want to put there and then evaluate whether that word you would put there fits with any of the other words in our answer choices. Question two here on module two, we have <clears throat> another word in context vocab type question. We're looking for a synonym, something in the context to give it away. We see this word theft, identity theft, and high society blank. So we're looking for something that goes along with the idea of um, theft, things which don't fit theft. So leprosy. Being a leper or having leprosy as a condition, it can mean colloquially that you are something of a pariah, meaning you're an outcast from society or treated like a leper because people with leprosy were contagious. Um, they were kept away from general society so that they wouldn't make others sick. So being cast off was kind of goal with that doesn't really work here grift means theft now grift often has a kind of a connotation of like scammy so it's not just theft in terms of stealing it's usually also within the connotation of like convincing someone to to let you rob them uh, munificence is like being really generous. Um, so this isn't giving away. And then delegation is uh, either to give something out or to be in a delegation, which would be like kind of like a group that represents something. Neither of those work. So grift is what aligns with theft. And that's why we like it. So for two, we have B. Question three on module two, we're looking for something to give our word context. It's a word on context. So we're looking for something that shows what kind of word we want there. So we see unique blend. Oh, I don't know why it went all the way over there. Uh, we see unique blend. We see... Eclectic music choices and continually pushing the boundaries in the dance realm, groundbreaking works. Right, we see all of this language, which is connoting doing something that's very new or atypical. So innovative means that perfectly. So we have a good word choice there, but I also want to show why other words are wrong and maybe talk a little bit about how we um, can, can figure out what words mean to get rid of them. So we have derivative, a word that we've seen actually in another module, maybe of this test or another test. Derivative means to be unoriginal, to base your, to, to, to base your work on something that comes previously. Um, Hegemonic, we have to mean kind of solitary power. A hegemon is basically the king. It comes from Greek, I believe, which means leader. Um, so a hegemonic, we can get rid of on the basis of it meaning just dominance or leadership. Her choreography could perhaps be hegemonic if it kind of defined how all other choreographies work or look, but we see everything as saying, go new, go new, go new. And then finally, 
um, obsequious or however it's exactly pronounced being basically just means being obedient. All right. Um, obsequious. Maybe it sounds, I don't know why it kind of gets this shiss thing. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's usually used to refer to people who are like, it's almost in their nature to be obedient. Okay. So it's to like, um, you know, someone who really wants to be serving someone else. So innovative is the only one that conveys groundbreaking, pushing boundaries, etc. Question four here on module two is another vocab or word and context question. As always, we're looking for some context that clarifies what word we want there. And we want to find out with our own word there. So in this text, we see that tardigrades can survive extreme conditions that would be lethal to most other organisms. And we see remarkable survival abilities. So in this topic, we can see we're looking for something that means like strong or, you know, unlikely to die, resilient. Um, so resilience obviously works because resilience means strength in the face of, you know, odds. Um, various miltude doesn't work because various or as you can see there is coming from uh, Latin for real or truth. Uh, and verisimilitude is like a really hyper realistic thing. Uh, it started out describing like the, the uh, sculptures called busts of uh, Roman senators for making them look so real. Uh, infirmity. Oops. Infirmity coming from the root infirm, meaning illness, right? Means that it's an, an illness or an issue, of, you know, something along those lines. And then avarice means greed. None of these work. Resilience is what works. If you're missing this question, it's likely that there are multiple words in our answer choices here that we just do not know. And uh, therefore, we can't apply a sensible strategy. But if we know couple of these words, this one's actually should be pretty easy. So if you're missing this, you should be studying up on your vocab. We now look to question five on module two of test 301. We are asked to identify the main purpose of a poem. So this poem is pretty interesting. We see a transition from night to day light strengthens, the room takes shape. Um, then we see some interesting tone words. We cannot escape yet can't accept. One side will have to go being night or day. Meanwhile, telephones crouch ready to ring and all the uncaring, intricate rented world begins to rouse. This guy's white as clay with no sun, work has to be done. Postmen's like doctors go from house to house. So we have a certain foreboding element to the coming day. So here, some good things in answer choice one. Transition from night to day. Day is bleak. So this word here is a little curious to me. I'm a little worried about it. If there's a better answer choice, I might choose it because... We do have a stark reality of daytime. We do have a relatively bleak, bleak day, and we do show this transition. But I'm not getting gentle night from this necessarily. But I, we want to make sure that this is, if we elect not to go with A, that there's something that is better, okay? Um, which there isn't, All right? So what do we not like about B? What's very clearly wrong? A joyful city. The bustling activity as dawn breaks. So dawn breaking is good. Awakening is good. But where is the joy here? 
And where is the vividness? Therefore, we have to get rid of B. Um, so with C, do we get, we get a little bit about the morning routine of postman, right? That's all good, but do we get this? No. Are we getting this? No. Okay, that's not the main idea. That's not the main point. And then finally, D, changing weather patterns. Huh? Doesn't make any sense. Gentle spring season. Huh? That doesn't make any sense. So even though there's something I'm a little bit curious about in A, there is something very clearly wrong in our other answer choices that leads us to A. All right, so here we have question six. There's a little bit of a tricky little thing here um, in that on, uh, for some reason, while transferring this over to notability, I lost the question stem, which should say, which choice best describes the overall structure of the text? So something along those lines. Maybe not that explicit wording. I think it is that explicit wording, though, is what you saw. Um, so not sure why that didn't copy over to notability. Happens sometimes. Uh, regardless, we want to describe the overall structure of the text. So we see uh, someone saying, a, a speaker, a kinsman, um, says, <clears throat> we gather not because of the moon, we gather not because of the food, we gather because it is good for kinsmen to do it. All right, so um, there's no shared memory here. Um, this part is wrong, a little bit confusing. B, is there a collective fear of starving in darkness? No, if you're selecting that, you're probably reading too interpretively. The beauty of the moon is wrong, and we don't see it as a symbol. So the only one that works here that doesn't make any weird errors is D. What's good? Yes, it is important to come together, not for food or ambience, but for the company of their kinsmen. So that's all there. Therefore, we have D. Question seven here on module two, we have a command of evidence question that is connecting two passages. We need to do synthesis. So based on the text, how would the authors of text two respond to the statement? Male cats are heterogametic, okay? Um, so, first things first, when we get this idea, this question of how would they respond, they already do respond. Um, they already have addressed this issue uh, explicitly in the text. So we wanna be going through the text, but first we wanna also make sure we find the statement asserted in text one. So here it is, male cats are heterogenetic, gametic, carrying one X and one Y chromosome. So let's find in the passage two, in our second text, where does the text respond or talk about this? So here we see, for a male cat to be tortoise shell, they must not be heterochromatic. Instead, they must have an extra Y, an extra X chromosome. So they're not heterochromatic, they have an extra X chromosome. So therefore we are seeing here, this second is the response to the first. So our answer needs to convey that. So A, uh, almost true, except Y chromosome and Klinefelter syndrome seems to be what it's called in humans. Um, maybe not what it's called in cats, but the issue is it's not an extra Y chromosome, it's an extra X chromosome. Um, B, the issue is that there's nowhere in here which says that heterogametic cats develop a tortoiseshell or calico coloring because of specific environmental factors. That's not present. C, this is completely wrong. Uh, males who are heterogametic gametic can never exhibit or, or, okay. So it is true that this is a little bit poorly written. Uh, so that or is important. So the denying is wrong. It does say that heterogametic males are either orange or black. It doesn't refute that. But then blue, 
On rare occasions, they are not heterogametic, but instead have a genetic anomaly in which they have two extra two X chromosomes that allows for a calico or tortoise shell coloring. That's what we're looking for that perfectly describes it. Be methodical. Question eight on module two is a command of evidence question. We're being asked to make sense of the evidence here. We want to make sure that we are being deductive in our reasoning. So we have an assertion that the individuals were of high so societal status. So um, here is the assertion that the people in these different tombs at the pyramid in Sacra are high status individuals. So what are some things that could maybe demonstrate that? Um, we have esteemed official with a large limestone sarcophagus. Um, and then others here. Okay, so let's be deductive in getting rid of our answer choices more than anything, right? We are being logical here. So to support high esteem. So the goddess Hathor um doesn't quite relate here right um b this is irrelevant c is irrelevant but d uh limestone is that big one they use a big limestone sarcophagus it's a coveted resource, therefore they're using one of the most desirous resources to entomb a person, therefore that person must have a lot of esteem or a credential or power or what have you in order to deserve such a special burial. Question nine here on module two, we have a text structure and purpose. Okay, so we're asking, um, how does this underlined portion function in the passage overall? Okay, so we always want to remember, if we're being asked about the function in the passage as a whole, the whole text is relevant. We cannot only read the underlined portion. If you're missing this question, there's a high likelihood you're focusing too much on the underlined portion and not enough on the passage as a whole. So, the Praha people of the Amazon have a unique approach to counting the numerical concepts. The normal or traditional system is absent. Therefore, they rely on approximations and relative terms, such as few or many. So we're comparing. Um, it's a fundamentally different understanding of numbers than is commonly found. They do not possess words or structures for exact numerical values. Um, so this is what's so unique about the Paraha linguistic approach to counting and numbers. They do not possess words or structures for any exact numerical value. So, A, it does seem to elaborate on a claim or perhaps elaborate on something before, but what is wrong here? Across Amazon tribes linguistic diversity. That claim was never made. So it elaborates on something. It elaborates on what kind of approximations and stuff they do, specifies it, but it doesn't talk about the other Amazon tribes. Again, B, it what's wrong here a broader theme regarding indigenous cultures and their unique practices that really doesn't seem relevant whatsoever c there is no difference in cognitive ability here right it's only a difference in how numbers are or how value is perceived 
So D, it clarifies the specific absence. It's perfect. So, well, they said that there was a difference and that they rely on approximations in relative terms. And then they specifically say, they specify that it's just, they do not possess words for exact numerical values. So D is exactly what we're going for. And that's what we see. So question 10 is asking for a logical completion. Okay, so these logical completion questions require uh, us understanding typically transitional adverbs like this very important therefore. So we see that there is talking about a study in 1998, which suggested a potential link between uh, onset of autism spectrum disorders and a vaccine. However, this study had a small sample size and several methodical flaws. One of the most significant being that it didn't adequately control for the influence of confounding variables. Um, further investigations and larger scale studies concluded they didn't find any supporting link. Okay, so this one study from 1998, therefore, is an outlier. Um, and conclusions drawn from that study, therefore, we were looking for something that says something along the lines of are either misguided or uh, too specific. Uh, you know, they, 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 they're not considering all the other later evidence. So A says that, right? Conclusions drawn from solely that drawn solely from the 1998 study, therefore, are drawing this connection, even though subsequent research and better studies provide no evidence. So that's exactly true and also seems logically where the text is going because of that important transitional verb, adverb, therefore. Um, first off, these are not what the study even considers. They're considering vaccines. Again, it's unrelated. Uh, now, C, I like this, right? Endorse the researcher's conclusions at the ris risk of neglecting later research. That's exactly what we're looking for, except in teens who have received other vaccines beyond MMR. That's the part that's unsupported, okay? So this is a classic tempting half-right distractor. I think a lot more of us would select C if C came as A, if A and C were switched. Finally, D, reveal more about the methodical, methodological shortcomings of later studies than about this is unrelated to the text. This is kind of like a edgelord take. So the only one that logically completes the therefore of this text would be A. Question 11 on module two, we have a command of evidence quantitative question. So we're looking at quantitative information, making a command of evidence, trying to understand that information. So a few important things here. Um, these are CO2 emissions when burned. All right. If you're reading this wondering, wait, trees, if you're looking at the graph without focusing on the text, you're going to think, wait, trees don't output carbon dioxide that's the exact opposite well no this is when they're being burned um so what is the big correlation between these two things uh despite very density co2 output is surprisingly close therefore as we see here we are looking for this researcher's claim what is the researcher's claim density of wood species does not correlate directly with its co2 emission rate so what data in the table best shows that? So I'm looking at the table and I see hickory is very dense, box elder is very light, and yet their carbon output is exactly the same, seemingly. So something like that. Any comparison in which a higher density wood and a lower density wood have the same carbon output is going to be helpful. So um first things first we want to be on the lookout 
for answer choices which are sensible or could be true, but or, or answer choices which would describe or answer the question if true, but are not actually borne out in the data. Classic example that is B. So emitting CO2 at the same rate despite a different density is really good, but is elm higher density than hickory? No. All right. So B is wrong, not because it gives a poor argument to support the claim, but because it improperly uses data from the graph. This is the sort of trap that the SAT will use to screw you over. Um, a, uh, so for one, this isn't true anyways, but secondly, it's not relevant. We need to compare density and carbon dioxide output. Um, C would be true if the question asked which best it didn't, if it said which of these would refute the researcher's claim rather than support. Uh, but we're looking to support it and having a high density, meaning higher CO2 output, they, that would suggest some sort of correlation. So finally, the density across the five woods show a relatively varied distribution, which is true, right? Box elder is a little less dense, hackberry a little more dense, hickory even more dense. CO2 re emissions remain constant, right? That's exactly the sort of information we're looking for. So therefore we can go with D. We are working here on question 12 of module two on this test. We are looking to do a command of evidence quantitative question. So looking at our question, most important thing that you maybe missed if you missed this question is we are talking about weakening the student's conclusion. So we want to weaken the student's conclusion. So what is the student's conclusion? The reduction in the seed population count in the bird enclosure was entirely due to the presence of birds. All right. Um, so this student is wanting to see how many seeds uh, uh, are consumed by birds. And we have a control which has no birds and experimental with birds. And as you see, both of them progressively go down, though the group with birds goes down by more. Um, so the student is saying that it is entirely due to the presence of birds. However, it goes down with no birds. Okay, so we're going to look for an answer choice which says there was a decline in seed population in the enclosures without birds, which we see here on C. So if you're missing this question, I feel like this question is actually relatively easy, but you're not making, you're not noticing weaken. You're not noticing that we need to weaken the student's conclusion. Um, if A could be true, right? Day 10 to day 15 maybe has the largest decline in seed population, but it's not relevant to their claim, nor does it refute it. Um, B, that would support the student's claim which we are not looking for. We're looking to weaken the student's claim and it's also missing. It's not true. Uh, they are different. Um, and finally, five is true, but it's irrelevant. It doesn't weaken the student's conclusion. So D doesn't weaken the student's conclusion. Only C weakens the student's conclusion. Make sure we're staying really clean on reading our questions. For question 13, we have a command of evidence question. We are looking to find a finding which most directly supports the team's conclusion. So first things first, we got to find the team's conclusion. We all read this. So their findings indicate that the dodo and solitaire are closely related, both in the larger pigeon family Columbidae. All right. So they look very different, we see. Um, they are hard to uh, put into, the, the dodo is, is hard to classify, um, yet we see that the dodo um, 
is really related to a different species and maybe evolved from that species. So what would most directly support the conclusion? Um, well, we want to see that they are related at one point. Okay, so um, A is totally a relevant distractor. That might be true, but what relevance does that have to a similarity between the dodo and the solitaire? Um, B would be an opposite distractor, right? This would weaken the, the team's conclusion. C, well, this is interesting, right? They have similar diets, but at the same time, you know, the liver king has a very similar diet to a wolf, but he's not related to a wolf. He's just a freaky dude, right? He's a human. So similar diets are not enough to demonstrate similarity or prove or support similarity. But D, we see close relation coming from further research. That's exactly what we're looking for. So therefore, we go with D. So we are looking at a final reading question here asking about command of evidence to weaken a claim. So we want to make sure that we are weakening a claim. So with 14, um, on module two, we want to weaken the claim made by Gall and phrenologists. So Joseph Gall, a phrenologist, claimed that in traits and mental abilities can be examined by the skull. Um, however, we have different experiments later on, which show distinct roles in the brain. Um, so the frontal lobe is speech, the cerebrum and cerebellum are different roles. So therefore, yeah, so, um, <clears throat> which would weaken the analysis. So B is really good. Why do we like B? Because by identifying these specific regions that control bodily functions, they undermine the phrenological attribution of mental abilities to bumps and contours of the skull. So B is good. Now, let's see what's wrong with our other ones. Um, so A would demonstrate a phrenologist approach, right? Analyzing cranial dimensions is exactly like analyzing and examining the bumps of the skull, so that wouldn't weaken it. Um, this, again, would support the phrenological pseudoscience. Um, and D is also seeking to support the phrenological pseudoscience. So what's really important here, we need to directly weaken the approach. And with that, we come to the end of the reading portion of Module 2. So here on Module 2, question 15, the first of our writing questions in Module 2, we have a question about tense. All right, so Nikola Tesla, oops, I don't know why that took like that. Nikola Tesla, a Sub Sub Serbian American inventor, played a pivotal role in advancing electrical technology. His work, blank, recognized globally for its revolutionary impact. So we want to recognize a tense which shows that it was at one point recognized and still to this day continues to be recognized. Um, so we need it to be both present and past, essentially. Um, our first thing as well, though, that we would like to acknowledge is that several of these are in the wrong number. All right, so his work have been. Why could we maybe be falling for B? Well, if we were thinking about his inventions, right? Uh, his inventions have been recognized globally, right? Um, but have, we need two, plural, but work is singular, so have doesn't work. The same goes with uh, are and were. All of these are wrong because work is in the wrong number. So C is the only one that works on the number sense. However, let's also consider it from the, sense, from the tense 
since. We want something that shows something that began in the past but continues to this day. What's the what do we want for that? The present perfect. That's always where the auxiliary verb, the helping verb is has. You know, uh, if you were talking about me, you might say Rio has been teaching for many years now. Um, it's something I began in the past, but continue to this day. So goes it with the case here. For 16, we're basically being asked, is this second element of our second sentence an independent clause or is it not? So we have particularly which is something of a subordinating complex some or a subordinating conjunction sometimes but not always um let's see how this works so garcia lorca work garcia lorca's work is noted for its insights into the complexities of the human condition particularly its emphasis on the hum female experience within a patriarchal society so if there's one thing i want to note as a issue here a period or a semicolon can combine or separate independent clauses in the exact same way, right? We'll never be asked on the SAT to discern, oh, should this be two different sentences or one sentence with two independent clauses? No, we won't be asked that. These C and D function exactly the same. And therefore, we cannot choose either of them. Uh, why? Well, we don't have a independent clause, particularly its emphasis on the female experience within a patriarchal society uh, is not a clause which can stand on its own. Um, but particularly without any punctuation creates a run on. So our only correct answer choice is B. Look to be deductive in your reasoning here and watch out, you know, seeing these differences between C and D or seeing how the C and D are, have no differences um, is a good little trick, if you will, but don't let that become a rule to yourself in that there might always be something difficult to notice that's different between C and D. Maybe there would perhaps be a little comma after particularly or something like that, right? If there's any difference, you can't eliminate on the basis of being the same. Okay, in this case, they are exactly the same, but sometimes they'll seem exactly the same, but they'll have a bit of a difference. So make sure you're looking at how they function rather than just the way they look. 17 here on module two is a bit of a tricky question if you're not reading super well, super closely. This word by is incredibly important. If you're missing the word by, it's gonna be hard to get 17 correct. But if you see by, it gets really easy. So we all know that the by plus verb ing form is a thing. By running to the store, you will save time. They can do this by utilizing their unique echolocation system, blah, blah, blah. We know that that is a form. By to utilize doesn't make any sense. By utilizes doesn't make any sense. By utilize doesn't make any sense. But to utilize would work here if by didn't exist. So. Make sure if you're missing this question, you stick to the text really clearly and closely. You really read the text and you don't allow yourself to lose the context because the context is where the correct answer is for 17. In my opinion, a really easy question that is nonetheless an easy question to make a mistake on if you're moving too quickly. Question 18 here on module two is a classic example of what does the role of what is the role of punctuation we don't want to just allow the hearing of a pause cause us to put in punctuation if that punctuation doesn't have a role so in this case in the usa transportation safety is regulated by federal by several federal agencies that enforce strict standards blah 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 right it's a long sentence but we wouldn't separate this sentence up here there's no need to okay what we use a semicolon for either items in a list or to start or end in an independent clause. We don't have that. Um, D does the same problem. And then C, what would this dash accomplish? If you miss this question, I'm assuming you maybe missed the dash or you're getting confused or too interested in, well, I, well, you know, I, I, I need to put some punctuation here. It can't just be this. This is all you need. All you need. 
So we have another question about conjugation here on question 19 on module two. Make sure we're reading the whole thing. During an eye test, patients gaze through a series of lenses at a chart containing letters of the alphabet. Ophthalmologists use this data to assess a patient's visual acuity. All right, so I accidentally read the correct answer there, but I think this should be really clear. Um, if we are missing this here, we may choose the wrong answer. So this data assesses a patient's visual acuity. Now that doesn't exactly work because data cannot assess a thing, an ophthalmologist must assess it, right? But I can see how that sounds correct. Or ophthalmologists assess, use this, you know, ophthalmologists assess a patient's visual acuity, right? We just need the whole context of this to get it correct. Um, it, the infinitive form is the only thing that works here. With question 20 here on module two, we are continuing with the writing section. So this is asking about independent clauses. Where do they end? We want to make sure. So, and, and uh, how we utilize a transitional adverb when we are using it to separate clauses. So our first thing is we want to figure out what is moreover this word that we're using to transition. What is it transitioning between? So Diego Velasquez. So this is one of those ones where if you're not reading the whole text, you might be missing it. Diego Velasquez, renowned Spanish painter, was the premier artist in King Philip IV's Spanish court during the Golden Age. His works influenced many 19th century realist and impressionist artists. Moreover, 20th century luminaries like Picasso and Dali reimagined some of Velasquez's iconic paintings. Okay, so moreover is transitioning between our first clause of the second sentence and our second clause of the second sentence. How do we know? Well, it is a building transition, and that transition builds from its first place of influence on 29th or on 19th century realists and impressionists to his second phase of influence on 20th century luminaries. So that means we need moreover to take place in the second clause. So it must come after the semicolon, not prior. So that means we can get rid of D and we can get rid of C, which has moreover as an embedded transition, meaning that there is no clause separation here. But we have different subjects in our, um, well, actually, his work remains the same subject in both, but we, we have different considerations in the two different clauses, so we need to separate them. Now, how do we introduce a, a, a transitional adverb at the beginning of a clause? Well, whether it comes after a semicolon or after a period, we need a comma at the end of our transition, seeing as that we are using it to introduce the clause. So A, we're using the right thing but we're with the semicolon, but we're missing the comma, therefore it's wrong. B is our best option. All right, a little quirk here on 21. Should be an enter there so we can see thing. But situated in Ireland's Connacht province, County Sligo is recognized for the Ben Bulben Mountain, a notable natural feature. So... <clears throat> What makes A and C wrong here? Well, in each of these, a notable natural feature would be an independent would need to be an independent clause. Coming after a semicolon or after a period would require it to be an independent clause. But does this have a preterite? Uh, or um not preterite, uh predicate, excuse me. Does this have a verb that we are using? No. It is solely the subject. We solely see a no notable natural feature. So this is functioning more like an elaboration. And typically with elaborations, we'd use a dash or a comma. However, because it is so, so shortcoming with only a recognition of that, we can use just a comma. Uh, B is incorrect because it creates a run-on. It introduces a new topic or a new subject without any punctuation. So D is our best option for 21. 
For question 22, we have a transitions question. I want us to make sure we're thinking about what is the function of the transition in this location and what category of transition do we want before we start putting in our transitions and just seeing if they sound good or work. I think if we just plug into sound good, we often will fall for traps. So evergreens retain green and functional foliage. However, deciduous plants shed their leaves. So we're looking for a transition, uh, a uh, pivot transition, one which compares like, however, yet, or in this case, in comparison. Um, currently means that two things are going on at the same time, which is probably the case here, but it's also been going on forever. It's not present enough. Similarly means it would be the similar, but of course, deciduous and evergreens are very different in that one sheds their leaves and one keeps them. And still would mean that it's kind of serving as a little bit of a, it's, it's, it's something of a contrast, but it requires like the first element being, it, 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 it doesn't work on that basis. All right. So in comparison, we're looking to compare. It's perfect. Very straightforward, very easy. So 23, we have another transition question. We're wanting to make sure that we're choosing a word that fits the context of the transition rather than just plugging in and playing all of our options. Why do we want to not just plug in and play? Well, first, when you plug in and play, it sounds pretty good. First, the gradual fragmentation of Prangia led to the formation of contents that we know today, right? However, with the whole context, because we need to read the whole passage, we will see that uh, during the Carboniferous period, um, it began to break apart. It formed during the Carboniferous period, okay? So it formed first, then it began to break apart, and now, finally, eventually, it fragments, okay? So it's not first because first is actually here or here. So alternatively would mean a different option that is kind of hypothetical or uh, it's just not working here. And instead and alternatively are too similar. So eventually means over the course of time, which is what we see. We are demonstrating over the course of time from 3,335 million to 200 million to now present day. So with another transition question here on question 24 on module two, we want to make sure we're not just plugging in answer choices to see if they sound good. We want to be thinking what kind of category of transition do we have? What context does it need to fulfill? So possibly doesn't work because it's a hypothetical. Right. So we see here that first there's the longest running radio soap opera. Then we then we have the longest running TV soap opera and then the longest running soap opera in general, which started with uh, radio, then moved to TV, but then finished. OK, so. Finally, would work for the final one. But we get another option after ITV, right? The guiding light. So because ITV Coronation Street is not the final of our options listed, it can't be used finally. And then essentially means, you know, it's 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 to say that it's to clarify what something is. Usually it distills the essence of a definition into something more simple. So similarly means similar in a similar manner. So, while The Archers is the longest on radio, Coronation Street is the longest on TV. It's perfect for what we're going for, similarly. We have a final transition question here for question 25. We're being asked about uh, what category of transition we have. Uh, we don't want to just take our answer choices and plug them in. We want to make sure that we are seeing if they fit the context, okay? So um, we hear all the way from the beginning that Ulan Batar, Mongolia has a very strange weather system. It's very difficult with notably prolonged and severe winters. Now we want to say in emphasis that yes, these winters, these conditions pose challenges for inhabitants and infrastructure. 
So Indeed is a perfect uh, emphasis transition. Um, now, first would mean something happening first. That doesn't really make sense because this isn't the first thing. It's not beginning a list or anything like that. But what about these other two? Nevertheless, or on the contrary. So first, nevertheless, and on the contrary kind of means something very similar. So it would be hard for you to discern between the function of each of these two in the passage. But more importantly, their function would not make sense in this passage. So nevertheless, or on the contrary, both would be a pivot to refute something that comes previously. Now, would it refute or go against the idea established in the sentence previous to say, it's really cold there with mild summers, but really cold, horrible winters. Nonetheless, or however, weather posts several challenges, that doesn't make any sense, right? They, it, 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 it's an opposite distractor. So the only one that shows emphasis, which is what we're looking for, is indeed. Question 26, we have a rhetorical synthesis question. This question type, unlike any other question type on the test, I want us looking at the question first, because we are being asked to say, what is relevant and what is irrelevant based only on what the question is asking, not what on the notes convey themselves. So we want to explain benefits and drawbacks of both AM and FM. Okay, so we want to make sure that we get pros and cons of both AM, AM and FM radio. So here we have a AM radio. And here we have FM radio. So FM is more complex and expensive and provides better sound quality, whereas AM offers longer wavelengths, meaning they can go further, all right? So um, how I would actually highlight this is we want to have both AM and FM, all right, pros and cons. So looking through our answer choices, we want to make sure that we're not choosing just AM or just FM or just benefits or just negatives. All right, so A describes something else in the notes, but it's irrelevant to what we're actually being asked about, right, which again is both benefits and drawbacks. So watch out with that. It's a, it's a true to the text, but irrelevant to the question. Um, B is a compelling distractor because we get a comparison, which is what we want, but we only get, so we get a benefit, which is what we want, and we get a detriment, which is what we want, but we only get our yellow FM. We're missing our pink AM. So therefore we can get rid of B. Now, C, which is correct, we get AM benefit and negative. Additionally, we get FM benefit and negative. So we get all the parameters that we need. So C is looking good. And D only explains what AM or FM is. So there's a good element of explanation, but where is the comparison? of benefits and drawbacks not present in D. So the only answer choice which con conveys both benefits and drawbacks of both FM and AM, answer choice C. Question 27 here, the final question of module two on test 301 is a rhetorical synthesis question. Unlike any other question, I want us looking at the question prior to the text, because we only want to emphasize certain things. It's not the notes as a whole. So we want to emphasize biodiversity in the Mariana Trench, and we want to emphasize scientific exploration. So we're not really needing to explain exactly what the Mariana Trench is. We're not looking to explain much else other than the exploration to get there and the biodiversity that exists there. So as we look through our notes, we see biodiversity here. 
and we see scientific exploration here and perhaps here. All right. Um, so we do not need ge geologically active earthquakes. We do not need too much of a description there. All right. So which of our answer choices talk about biodiversity? Let's find biodiversity. Is it an A? No. Why? We get our yellow, but we don't have our pink. For B, no, because we get just geology, we don't have yellow or pink. C, hmm, well, we get our yellow, but it is missing our pink. So therefore, D is the only one we could be confident on anyways, because there's a problem with the rest. But we see biodiversity here. And we see scientific exploration on the geological or biological sense there. So we have both pink and yellow. We have the two parameters we need. The rest only have one parameter at most. Therefore, D works. And with that, we come to the end of test 301.